Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, snow science, learning to read snowflakes, presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Charlie Reinertson. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Charlie. Thanks, Rob, and welcome, everyone. I hope you're having a great afternoon. It's a beautiful snowy day here in Adirondack Park. I'm calling in from Saranac Lake, New York, and uh, we've been getting buckets of snow these last few days. So this uh, felt like a fitting chat to be able to dive into some snow science and thinking about winter ecology and some of the things that you might see on trips that take you to, into climates where you might see some snow. And uh, just to give you an idea of what we'll cover today, I'll introduce myself, tell you a little bit about my path to where I am now, and then we'll do what I like to call snowflake detective. So if you haven't looked closely at snowflakes, you're gonna wanna go somewhere with snow and spend some quality time after this chat uh, because no snowflake is alike. And we're gonna dive into that and kind of understand what's happening there and, and what it can tell us about snowpack and winter conditions. And lastly, we'll talk about wildlife and plant survival tactics uh, that they use in the winter. And it won't be a, you know, a comprehensive look, but we'll kind of look at some case studies of certain animals that are doing some pretty neat things to be able to survive the winter. So just a little bit about me. I've worked in the field of science communications for the last decade, uh, most recently working on an exhibit up here in the Adirondacks uh, called Climate Solutions. And it's all about sharing uh, stories from people in Adirondack Park and beyond who are working on climate solutions and how to solve this really uh, massive issue that we're facing. Uh, and uh, my career has really brought me in touch with some incredible organizations and amazing opportunities. And I've had the chance to guide and educate and photograph uh, throughout the world. And uh, working with Natural Habitat Adventures, I have the opportunity to guide with them about four times a year. And I guide in Yellowstone National Park, Grand Teton, canyons, and also on the monarch butterfly migration trip, uh, all of which are truly amazing and if you want to hear about those uh, I've done some webinars on those as well and they're in the daily dose archive a uh, little disclaimer my voice is a little bit under the weather today and so if I uh, need to cough I might just turn my camera off for a second uh, so if the stream gets interrupted that's why uh, but uh, just to dive in here uh, the next chapter of this talk is to uh, indoctrinate you into becoming a snowflake detective. Now, uh, I'm, I've been known to carry around a little card in my wallet that I've laminated because if you pull it out in the snow, it'll get wet. Uh, and that card will help you identify the snowflakes uh, that you'll encounter. But before we get to that point where we're ready to start IDing the crystal structures, what is snow? Uh, snow has more than 50 words or phrases in the English language to describe snow conditions and the types of crystal formation. And at first you might think, wow, that's a lot of words. I can't imagine there are that many words. But you start to think about it, blizzard, sleet, grapple, snow. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And then you start to think about, you know, people who have careers studying snowpack from avalanche science uh, to, uh, you know, field ecologists who are studying snowpack and how it impacts wildlife habitat. So there are tons and tons of words to describe uh, this, this pretty amazing thing. And another way of looking at what is snow is just, it is frozen water, right? And the other way to define it is how snow is formed. And so snow is formed in the atmosphere, uh, when the atmospheric water vapor goes below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is the point at which uh, we start to form ice crystals and we start to see what we think of as snow. And something I'll highlight here is, you know, when we learn about these things in high school, potentially if you took uh, physical science, you'd maybe learn about the transition between states, right? Liquid solid gas. And this one's really cool because snow is created 
through the process of deposition. So you're transitioning from gas to solid, you're skipping the liquid phase, and that's cool. Uh, so it's made through the process of deposition, and the conditions in the cloud can create a huge diversity of snowflake types. So this kind of classic type that we're looking at here actually has a, a specific term. So if you're looking at this grid, uh, there are a few of those in there, and they're called stellar dendrites. And then there are all these other caps and columns and needles and all these different types of formations. And they are absolutely gorgeous when you look at them through a super micro lens. Uh, these are not my own pictures. They are, these are Alexei Kiatov's pictures. And a lot of people have spent whole careers just trying to capture the beauty of, of these snowflakes and isolating them from backgrounds. And uh, these crystals are actually forming based on a few different factors that are happening in the atmosphere. So the type of snow crystal is determined by atmospheric conditions. So this is where we start to be put on our detective hats because uh, looking at the structure of a crystal, you can actually start to infer what the atmospheric temperature and moisture might be when that crystal was formed. So you might have a warm day on the surface temperature as you're standing outside, relatively warm, 32 degrees, but perhaps these crystals formed at negative 32 degrees in the clouds at relatively low humidity. That would create a very different crystal than a relatively high freezing temperature and high moisture. So this is the graph that I use, I'll print this off and make it really small and put it in my wallet. And when it's snowing, I'll pull this out and take a look. Uh, yes, I'm a geek. And uh, it's fun to be a geek. So welcome. And uh, on the left here on the vertical axis, you have super saturation of the atmosphere. And on the right axis, you have temperature. And I'll just call your attention to the very center. You're seeing zero saturation or moisture and the temperature of zero on a scale of Celsius. So as you go to the right on this graph, you are getting colder and colder and colder. So what you're seeing here, that line as it's traced through uh, this graph is where different crystals are being formed. So just to highlight a couple things here, when you're at low moisture and warm temp, you're gonna get these certain things forming, such as plates, solid prisms, uh, those are the general forms. When you're at high moisture, moderate temperature, you're gonna start to see those classic snowflakes, that stellar dendrite form, where you have these arms and then crystals forming off of those arms. And sometimes when we're really, really saturated, you're actually gonna have stellar dendrites who have glommed together and created this really, really large flake that's actually a collection of many different crystals that have formed. So high moisture, moderate temp. And then at uh, low moisture, low temp, you actually get the formation of columns. And if you can see on that, on that picture, you're actually getting this kind of pyramid shape inside the column, and it's an octagon um, structure. And then you also get plates. So if you're you know, being a snowflake detective, you're not going to be able to perfectly extrapolate what is happening um, in the clouds. But you know that plates can occur between zero and roughly negative four degrees Celsius. And then they can also be formed between negative 10 and negative 20 ish. And then again, between 20 and 35. But if you're seeing columns being formed, the temperature is either in that band between negative five and negative 10 or negative 22 and negative 38. Uh, but the primary purpose of this is not to be scientific about it necessarily in my mind. To me, it's starting to be aware that when we're looking outside and it's snowing like it is right now in Saranac Lake, uh, you can start to catch some snowflakes, hopefully on like not on your skin because it'll melt, but on like wool is really good for capturing a snowflake and not melting it. And you can start to look at that structure and then start to extrapolate what's happening in the atmosphere or just appreciate that there are many more snowflake forms than you might have initially 
thought. So the next thing that happens is those snowflakes fall and then we create what's called a snowpack. And a snowpack is always changing. The snow, if it's, uh, and the way that it changes is dependent on a number of factors. You can have like this particular snowscape has been scoured by the wind. It's very smooth on top and that's a mechanical deterioration. So if we go back to kind of the stellar dendrite form, um, as that snowflake falls, as soon as a snowflake is formed, it is changing based on erosion, based on temperature changes, based on moisture changes. And so as it's falling, it's changing, and then it rests on the snowpack, and then it goes through additional changes. And so generally, those stellar dendrites start to lose those shafts, those needles, and they start to just become granular and very even. So if a snowflake falls and becomes part of a snowpack, and that snowpack itself has an even temperature gradient, meaning no matter where you measured the temperature of a two foot deep snowpack, it's all 32 degrees Fahrenheit, for example. Um, that would mean that that pack is going to just gradually over time, uh, become very stable and all of those granules become will become similar sized as they just move against each other and whittle each other down and just become these little round um, crystals. Uh, but what becomes interesting and has a huge impact for the safety of being in the backcountry or being up in the mountains and skiing is that you can create an unstable snowpack. And an unstable snowpack happens when there's a temperature gradient within the snowpack. So if you've got two feet of snow again, at the top of the snow, say it's 32 degrees, and at the bottom of the snow, it's zero degrees Celsius, um, then you're going to see changes take place that destabilize the snowpack. And you can have conditions that create a warm top and a cold middle, and a warm bottom, you can have all the different combinations of different bands of warmth or cold, depending on what the weather is doing outside, what stage we are in the in winter, whether it's night or day, all these different conditions can kind of change that temperature gradient. But what's important is that vapor, which is the moisture in gaseous form, is always moving. And in that snowpack, if you have a temperature gradient, uh, it is moving from the warm to the cold area. And as it moves to the warm to the cold area, the cold area is super saturated and the water is evaporating out. Yeah. And so as that happens, you have deposition. So if you have this happen where you have a warm band of snow on the bottom and a cold band of snow on the top, moisture is moving up, and as it moves up, it's uh, super saturated, so it's actually depositing as, as, as uh, crystals. You're gonna form a really unstable ice pack that's really fragile underneath, and that's where you start to get uh, big slabs of snow sloughing off and creating an avalanche. So this stuff is really important because it's, to me, it's interesting, and to a lot of people it's interesting. Uh, but it's also important because if you can really understand the way that snow changes over time, you can start to predict avalanche danger. You can start to understand how to uh, trigger an avalanche so that you can create safe conditions once it's stable again. Uh, but just to mention one more thing, we we're talking about a stable snowpack that has equal temperature. Uh, that's really the concept that the Quincy is built upon. So the Quincy is uh, a Native American snow uh, structure that's essentially built just by piling snow into a big dome, letting it sit, and then eventually, after many hours, carving out the inside. And that creates a really stable mass because you have allowed the snow to uh, change its crystal structure to essentially assimilate as a single unit, and then you're carving out. So you're allowing it to do that um very stable process of of um stabilizing i guess uh, for lack of better better way of saying that uh so that's just kind of a primer without diving too deeply now we'll kind of transition into talking about winter survival strategies 
Uh, but I mostly share the snow science because it's an area that can be really fun to learn more about. Um, the book that I'm really relying on here is Life in the Cold uh, by Peter J. Marchand. This is a really dense book, but it talks about winter ecology. It talks about snow science. And uh, if you are interested, if this you know kind of primer on snow uh, got you uh, wanting to learn more, this is a great resource to check out. Um, and uh, so this uh, next part, we'll start to talk about winter survival strategies uh, and the photos that we'll see you know coming up here are ones that i've taken uh, a lot of them are out in in uh, yellowstone national park and some of them are out uh, here um, in new england and also in the adirondacks so here uh, we have a pronghorn and i chose this one because uh, this is a pretty fun animal uh, where we have only very recently discovered that these animals travel more than 250 miles each year uh, to be able to escape incredibly harsh winter conditions in their summer range. Uh, you know, so they might live in Yellowstone and Grand Teton in the summer, and then they're gonna migrate 150, 250 miles down to the Red Desert where there isn't as much snow. Uh, so this migration strategy is one that a lot of animals have where they're following food availability, uh, and they're trying to get out of incredibly harsh conditions that would be hard for them or impossible for them to survive. Uh, but obviously this is a trade-off because it takes a lot of energy for that animal to be able to travel that distance. And so that animal is placing its bet uh, evolutionarily uh, on being able to find more food where they're going and to be able to get enough food to compensate for the energy it would take to go. What's interesting is something like a mule deer, uh, there are some mule deer that will travel 150 miles or even 200 miles uh, to uh, get to wintering grounds, but then another population of mule deer in the same exact region will actually survive winter and go through what they call resistance. So resistance is simply staying where you are and putting up with the fact that you're going to have less food availability, the conditions are going to be very harsh, and ultimately they're relying on fat reserves and a reduced metabolism simply by reducing their activity levels. So a lot of animals in the winter will move around less, uh, they'll uh, you know, only browse in certain areas that are really easy to browse and they won't waste time trying to get to other areas that might take a lot of energy or effort uh, because they're just trying to uh, survive uh, through the really harsh conditions. This animal represents another winter survival strategy and that is hibernation. And so black bears, grizzly bears, all the bears uh, will uh, find a den and scrape out a den. And sometimes these dens can uh, be surprising how insignificant they are. Uh, there are a lot of times it's just kind of a bough and snow accumulates over it, a bough of a tree, and the animal just chooses to, to be under that bough for the winter. Uh, so these, these animals can be in, in kind of surprisingly uh, exposed areas, but they go into this altered metabolism state where uh, you know these animals are, are uh, homeotherms, they're maintaining a stable body temperature. But in hibernation, hibernation, they're reducing the amount that they metabolize and sh basically shutting down their organs a ways and reducing their body temperature uh, that's an acceptable level for them to exist and just waiting it out until the other side. Uh, there are variations of hibernation like estivation where the animal is, is actually going through a short period where they are effectively hibernating, but that they come out of that so that they can go feed or be active. Um, and then there's even torpor, which is an even shorter version of that. Another strategy kind of similar to what we were talking about with the mule deer is having incredible adaptations to if not just survive to even thrive through the winter. So here we have an American bison, and this is an animal that used to exist throughout all of North America, but now is just in certain areas where we've conserved them or, or given them habitat and reintroduced them. 
Uh, but here you're seeing that they've got this huge um, bump on their back. And that bump is actually an adaptation that allows them to help survive the winter. Uh, these animals are using their heads like bulldozers to be able to push through that heavy snow to be able to get down to forage that they need to survive. And uh, their spinal cord, if you were to look at it, they, it actually has these uh, projections off of the spinal cord. It's just a modification of the vertebra. And um, that is a huge protrusion of bone so that this massive muscle trapezius muscle can come and attach to that bone to be able to use its head like a snow blower, uh, like a bulldozer essentially. Uh, so that is a specific adaptation that allows them to reach forage in the winter to get through a really deep snowpack. So bison migrate, but they just kind of migrate between, you know, one area that they like to be in the summer maybe 20 miles to another area that they like to exist in the winter. So effectively, they're in the same ecosystem, but just kind of occupying a little bit of a different habitat. Uh, just a second, I'll grab some water. And this picture was taken, I'm not sure if you can see on your screen, but if you zoom in, there's uh, some snowflakes. So there's a nice snowy scene while, while this picture was taken in Grand Teton National Park among the cottonwoods. Another survival strategy uh, or adaptation uh, is for animals to have uh, feet that allow them to stay on top of the snow. So wolves are one that they their feet are very large and a lot of surface area to disperse their weight, and it allows them to stay right on top of the snowpack. So wolves have this dense, dense coat of fur to keep them warm. Uh, and so they are really thriving in the winter. And this is a time when other animals like moose and deer and elk, uh, they actually uh, don't have enough of a surface area on their hooves. So they'll sink down into the snow. And so it's really energy intensive for them to move through it. And the wolves are just sitting right on top with their effectively snowshoe feet, uh, paws. And so they're able to, you know, hunt down animals uh, with, with a lot of ease, depending on the type of snowpack. Uh, because some snowpacks are really light or some snowpacks are really slushy, and those can be tough for them to travel in. But if we're looking at something like this, these are wolf tracks moving across uh, in Grand Teton National Park and actually in the Grovant Mountains. Uh, but uh, they're able to just sit right on top if the snowpack is stable. And uh, one of my favorite categories of animal, the amphibians and reptiles, here we have a boreal toad. And these animals are particularly amazing because their strategy, they're not gonna hibernate, they're not gonna estivate or endure. They simply freeze. So these animals will bury themselves in the mud underwater and they slowly freeze. And part of their uh, strategy here, or not strategy, adaptation here, is that they um, super saturate their, uh, uh, their fluid around their cells with sugars, and it allows them to have a depressed freezing point, so they, um, and, and it also prevents them from forming ice crystals that would puncture cells and, and cause issues. So these animals just freeze, and then Thaw in the spring and, and uh, uh, kind of an interesting side note here is that some people have pet amphibians or reptiles that go through this process and it's been proven that animals are healthier when they've adapted to be able to freeze this way. They, if you take out the effects of predation, um, they live longer and live healthier lives when they are allowed to go through that cooling process and freezing process over the winter. Um, so a captive toad might not be as healthy or as happy as a wild toad. And that's the case with tortoises. And if you want to go into a rabbit hole on Instagram, look up people putting their tortoises to bed for the winter, and then they reside in the freezer until the spring, and then they come back out. Uh, some folks will bury them in their gardens until spring, and they mark the location, and then they'll dig them back up and, and bring them out, which... Uh, you know that that to me is a, a leap of faith, but uh, it's it's kind of a uh, 
one of the wonders of the natural world. Similar to amphibians, when we start to look at trees, trees have incredible adaptations to be able to withstand the winter. Uh, and trees in particular go through this process called hardening, uh, where they are shunting water out of their cells and pushing it into their extracellular cellular regions. Uh, because if ice forms within their cells, they can have the possibility of rupturing organelles, and that would lead to cell death and ultimately death of the organism. And so one of the things that's important to note here is that trees go through this hardening process, which is still being researched and studied and kind of understood, uh, but part of the way just that the mechanics of water as they exist in the cell tissue and the tissues of plants there is automatically this this as long as the tree is getting cold slowly the plants have this ability to um, elevate the freezing temperature uh, so they they essentially um, super cool in the winter but the 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 take-home message is that as long as winters get steadily colder as the winter progresses trees are well adapted to be able to survive that and and be healthy through that where you run into a challenge is when we get rapid freezing or rapid thawing trees really struggle uh, because it, they don't have enough time to shunt water into the proper locations of their tissue um, and it can cause them again to have uh, ice crystals form and, and rupture their cells and so uh, with with climate change we're seeing winters that have more of a freeze-thaw cycle. And so we are seeing that, you know, it's it's uh, certain trees are having a tougher time uh, with that. And uh, in this in this photo on the left, we're seeing a, a white birch in the middle, uh, kind of a mixed stand of, of uh, balsam and maple, and on the right, a maple tree. And these pictures were taken in the Adirondacks and up in Northern New Hampshire as well. Just a second. So just in the category of amazing winter adaptations, uh, trumpeter swans as well as well as other waterfowl have a pretty amazing adaptation called countercurrent heat exchange. And basically what that means is that their arteries and their veins are wrapped around one another in their feet. And typically we have arteries and veins arteries a away meaning it is what delivers blood to the rest of your body from your heart veins return blood to your heart and in animals with countercurrent heat exchange the blood that's leaving the body uh, gets cooled by the veins that are returning from the extremity and that's important because of the laws of thermodynamics so we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive here on on thermodynamics but the idea behind it is when there's a large difference between temperature of two objects say it's your hand and the cold air if the temperature difference is great the rate of heat loss is high if your hand is close to the temperature outside the rate of heat loss is lower so in countercurrent heat exchange the returning blood is colder and it's cooling the blood as it leaves the animal so that by the time the blood reaches the extremity it has gotten to a closer temperature with the surrounding environment so that you're not losing as much heat to the environment the basic premise is that that swan's body is very very warm and because the arteries and veins are wrapped around each other it has very cold feet those cold feet transfer less heat to the environment because they're closer in temperature to the environment so that's why you can see waterfowl standing on ice in water in the winter which is pretty amazing so we're going to uh leave some room for questions but before we do i just wanted to note that uh next week on the 18th i will be back here at the daily dose of nature and i'll be 
talking about bogs through the seasons. And I've been working on uh, the Northern Peatlands Project, which is a project documenting one of our rarest ecosystems in the world, our peatlands, uh, of which bogs are one type of peatland. Uh, and uh, I've been doing a lot of aerial photography. So this is a, a photograph that I took um, about 20 miles from my house at one of the largest peatlands in New York State. And on the left-hand side, you're seeing a mixed conifer and, and deciduous forest. Um, and on the right-hand side, you're seeing the peatland. And these places are really unique in that uh, peatlands are just this buildup of vegetation that's slowly decomposing because it's waterlogged. And uh, it has a lot of mysteries and really specific plants and animals that rely on this ecosystem. And so I'd love to invite you to, to return next week on the 18th, same time, uh, for the Daily Dose of Nature then. And we'll talk about bogs and, and see some photographs and video that I've taken uh, through the seasons in this particular place. If you'd like to learn more about that project, you can go to my website, twolined.com slash tracks. That's two lined as in the two lined salamander, uh, which is native to this region and one of my favorite uh, critters. So uh, this is uh, my Instagram account, two lined studio, feel free to follow, feel free to get in touch with me with my email. I'd love to hear from you and hear about uh, what you thought about this presentation. And uh, with that, I'd love to open it up for questions for uh, uh, the remainder of the, the next 10 minutes or so. Thank you so much for uh, joining me today. And I hope you uh, are excited to go and, and uh, see what kind of snowflake you might be able to find and learn a little bit more about some of the amazing adaptations that uh, wildlife have to be able to survive the winter. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Now, before we start with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that if you do have questions, you can submit them via the question field in your control panel. All right, let's get to some questions if we have any. Uh, so what is the best way to look at a snowflake? Is a magnifying lens a good way to do that? I'm sorry, the screen just, uh... Yep, I'm back. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so uh, a couple ways. If you have a really big stellar dendrite, you're going to be able to see that with your naked eye. Um, but there are two things that you can do. You can take your binoculars and uh, rather than look through them the right way, flip them around and look through them the wrong way. You can still use the focus knob and that's effectively a microscope. So you can try it out, practice with like, a book where you can really make sure you're getting crisp text, uh, but flip your binoculars around, use them as a microscope. Um, the other thing you can do is buy a jeweler's loop. And a jeweler's loop is just this little device uh, that is just a really small lens and it's designed so that you can look at objects really closely. Uh, jewelers use them to, to make jewelry and to look really closely at objects. So that's a really good one, um, but yeah, you can definitely you can definitely see some stru snow structure uh, just by uh, getting a scarf that's wool and holding it out and and letting some snowflakes fall on it and then taking a really close look just with your naked eye and you'll be able to see it. Uh, it's it's uh, it's fun. Good luck. <laughs> So would all of the snowflakes that might land on my sleeve, would they all have the same basic structure or could they have been formed under different atmospheric conditions? Absolutely. You can you can have in one snowfall, uh, it's so exciting. You can have any number of things come down. You know, you can have a capped column, which I've only seen a couple of capped columns. Those are the ones where you have a double plate on either end and then an octahedron in a, I think it's an octahedron in it, where it's an extracted tube between. So it's like a dumbbell, uh, absolutely amazing. Um, so you can see all different kinds, essentially the, the conditions in the clouds, it's the exact condition wherever that particular crystal was formed. And obviously these crystals, like I said, as soon as they're formed, they're changing. So they might enter an area with more moisture. And so suddenly that plate gets a needle growing out from it, and that's how you would start to build a capped, uh, 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 capped uh, 
anyway, I lost the word for it, but uh, you get the idea. They change constantly, and in one storm, you can have a lot of different kinds. Great, thank you. So, uh, are there any tricks to photographing snowflakes? <laughs> yeah, these. So these folks that are taking these pictures, and and this is something that I I want to get into as well. I just haven't had the time yet. Um, you're using wool, so you would put some wool out, capture a few snowflakes, and the ideal thing would be if you have a shed that's the same temperature as being outside, you would move those snowflakes into the shed, but know that even just your body heat is gonna melt these snowflakes. So the next thing you'd wanna do is have really good lighting, either natural light or you'd have a flash or you'd have like a, a setup already, like a, a soft box light in your area. Um, and then the next thing you'd have to have is a macro lens. You could try it with like a 400 millimeter, uh, but most likely you're not gonna be able to get this type of image. Most likely this image is taken with 100 millimeter and then cropped. And this image is a composite image. Like I'm guessing that they took a bunch of images and then edited them and then put them into this mosaic here. This is an, a single image right here. And for an image like this, I'm guessing this person had to put it on wool, light it really, really well, and then they did a ton of work to get rid of any suggestion of wool. So you can do that a lot of times now with AI uh, software, you can just do like a select all and just delete the background, which is pretty wild. Um, and a lot of people will kind of poo-poo that or feel like, gosh, that's that's not great from a photography perspective. But, you know, people like Ansel Adams were wizards in the dark room. Uh, so, so using Photoshop, you know, Ansel Adams, I guarantee you he would be using Photoshop like crazy right now. Um, there are places where obviously it enters into a different world. But um, so lighting lens, you need a macro lens, probably at least 100 millimeters. Uh, there's a new field of super micro lenses now. Uh, so, uh, for example, Laowa is a company that makes a super micro and they'll do 50 times magnification. So on a snow crystal like this, you could probably zoom in just on the ridges on one little portion of the crystal. So that that is a pretty new area for consumers to be able to get a piece of equipment like that, because in the past, we used to rely on scientific instruments to be able to get images like this, but all of a sudden the technology has put us into another realm uh, where we're able to, uh, anybody is able to take images like this if they have the equipment, which is obviously expensive. But yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, this, the, this image here, you can actually see the wool in the background of the image that the crystal has been trapped upon. Um, and uh, these images, it's been edited out. So thank you for that question. That's a great question. Thank you for that great answer too. Um, <laughs> so is there a biome inside or underneath snowpack? Yeah, yes, thank you. That's a great question. So anytime you have a snowpack, uh, I can't believe I missed that. I was, I was gonna talk about that on these slides. So thank you. Uh, Beneath the snow snowpack, that, that's called the subnivian environment. And it's an entire ecosystem under there. And a lot of animals are actually reliant on it entirely uh, to be able to survive the winter. And so snowpack is providing this incredible insulation as well as protection from predators. There will be animals like uh, voles and mice and, and uh, chipmunks and squirrels that create tunneling system through the snow uh, that help them evade predators. You know, in the, in the winter, if you think about a, an owl or a hawk, uh, they have a great time in the winter because these animals typically stand out really nicely against the snow, uh, which brings up another adaptation of, of molting and having a different coat for the winter, like a snowshoe hair. Uh, and so uh, this, this subnivian environment is incredibly important. And there's been a lot of studies on a few things related to that. The subnivian environment, it's really important for it to be connected and vast. 
And so if you have instances where that habitat is uh, cut off, even by a trail, uh, the animals will then have to come out of that subnibian, get across that trail and get to the other side. And that can open them up to predation. Um, it can make their relative um, kind of home base smaller um, because they don't want to cross that that boundary. So yeah, thank you for that question. It's it's incredibly important for um, insulation, for protection from from predators, uh, and that's a whole ecosystem unto itself. So thanks for the question. So could you tell us the name of that book again? Yeah, Life in the Cold. Uh, it's it's not for the lighthearted. Uh, so it's Peter J. Marchand, and essentially he's synthesizing all of the research that we understand about snow and winter ecology, and it, he's like one step away from a peer-reviewed journal article. So it's very dense, but if you take it paragraph by paragraph and sip a coffee in between, uh, I promise you that you'll learn something interesting. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so one of our guests uh, had heard that uh, clickweed has an antifreeze inside its cell. Is that true? Can you comment on that? I don't know about that, um, but there are a lot of animals who um, shunt sugars around, which when so if you take water, its freezing point is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. If we take sugar and add it to that water, uh, we now have depressed the freezing point because we've created a solute and it will now freeze further. It will freeze at a colder temperature, right? Um, maybe 28 degrees instead of 32 degrees. So animals are able to do that um, physiologically. Their bodies are shunting around sugars and effectively reduce, lowering the freezing point. Um, and there are other mechanical things happening. Like I was talking about, there's surface tension on water and the, at a molecular level, um, there are physical structures in the molecules based on how water is existing within a vessel, and that vessel could be a plant tissue. Uh, there can be changes to that molecular structure that make it resistant to freezing. So it can actually freeze at an even lower temperature if it's within a tissue structure of a certain kind. That's the kind of stuff that this book goes goes into in depth, and I was brushing up on it before this talk, and I'm sure I. Uh, oversimplified it or, or uh, you know, made it a little bit less accurate, but that's the general concept. So without knowing about that particular species, I'm not sure what it's doing, um, but that's kind of the general concept between be, behind what both, you know, amphibians and, and plants are doing in the winter. So one of our guests is going to be out in Yellowstone in January and is looking for some tips on how to find some small critters in the snow. Yeah. Any uh, any suggestions? <clears throat> Good question. <clears throat> uh, the the biggest tip uh, that I can give you is is to go out and look for tracks. Um, anytime you start to see a track, then go follow that track and see it where, where it leads you. Um, and then pay attention to the freshness of that track. So if the track has snow that's come in or it's windswept or it just doesn't look like it's been very recent. Um, you know, pick up a tracking book that shows you what animal tracks look like, because some of them might surprise you, especially in the winter. The tracks look quite a bit different than they do in the in the summer and in, in mud or uh, wherever you might find tracks. So I think, you know, to me, if you're really looking for uh, wildlife, it's it's tracks. But then it's also just talking with the locals and and especially with local wildlife tours. It sounds like you might be going on a have trip, so you'll be in great ha hands there. Um, and you just want to find out what animal behaviors are in the winter because there might be a particular place where moose like to hang out or uh, where fisher like to hunt um, or where otters like to uh, spend time 
you know, the big one for otters and the Adirondacks. I've seen more otters in the last three years than I've seen in my entire life. Um, and it's because up here, there are certain areas where you have open water uh, just because it's moving a little bit faster and on the edge of a pond where a river meets a pond. Um, and the otters love to hang out where they can get up on the ice and then dive back into the water. So if you go and kind of cruise those places, uh, you've got a chance for, for otters. But yeah, pick up a tracking book and, and follow the tracks, um, get some snowshoes. <laughs> So do El Nino weather patterns cause any structures that are unique or is it just a shift in the warmer weather spectrum? Yeah, it's a good question. It's uh, it's atmospheric conditions <clears throat> are fairly, they're connected to what's happening on the ground, but they're, they're fairly different. And um, so they're not gonna create any ice crystals that we've never seen before. Uh, it's just more of an indication of what's going to happen to the snowpack, right? So um, I forget what the relationship is with El Nino, if it's more moisture and more warmth, but, um, you know, you might change the likelihood of certain crystals being formed, uh, but um, you won't have new ones being formed, but the snowpack itself might have implications. Maybe there will be less of a snowpack or more of a snowpack, and uh, so then you can start to see different avalanche dangers or things like that yeah great thanks for addressing that Charlie. unfortunately mm -hmm. that is going to be the last question that we do have time for today so i'd like to hand it back to you for your closing comments well thank you all for tuning in today i really uh, appreciate it um and uh you know please tune back in next week and uh join me as we talk about peatlands and Hope you have a wonderful afternoon and enjoy looking at snow a little bit differently now. Charlie, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you are interested in information on how you can travel with NatNab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We will see you next time.